You're listening to the For I Will Be With You podcast. For I Will Be With You. Daily Reflections on Recovery from the Bible. Welcome back to the For I Will Be With You podcast for the 45th week of the year from November 4th to November 10th, covering Deuteronomy 1.42 to Deuteronomy 4.29. So we're continuing with this uh, early verses of Deuteronomy, which, as we said last week, was a recounting of the uh, journey of the Israelites uh, on their in their journeys across the wilderness and it's being uh, spoken by Moses on what is uh, understood to be the last day of his life. So Deuteronomy 142, Moses says, God said to me, tell them, do not ascend and do not do battle, for I am not among you, so that you not be struck down before your enemies. This verse is referring to the incident of the spies which occurred earlier, where uh, Moses had sent 12 leaders of the tribes to scout out the promised land, and uh, 10 of the 12 spies had come back with a negative report, saying that they they doubted that the Israelites would be able to conquer the land. The Israelites had panicked, they rebelled, they demanded that Moses take them back to uh, Egypt. And the punishment for this rebellion was God decreed that they should wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the generation that had been born in slavery and had those fears would have died off. Then, this and this is not um, directly in the, in, the, in the Bible, but it's sort of a, uh, a, a side story. In a panic, a group of men went to conquer the land for themselves, a sort of separate, independently created force went out to conquer the land and they were all killed and that's what he's referring to here so um, tell them do not ascend and do battle he's warning people not to take matters into their own hands and defy the word of God and this tragedy is able to teach us a lesson in recovery because as we get sober and get some time In recovery, we can take small steps towards changing our lives. You know, one day at a time, baby steps. Rushing into things early in recovery is almost always a mistake. It's a little bit like these these men who decided they were going to rush off and conquer the promised land on their own without any uh, sort of sanction from Moses or God. So how can we avoid this mistake? There's usually there's one usually two ways it can be done. One is if we have our own strong God consciousness, we can learn to listen to ourselves and listen to God's word internally and consider that maybe we're making a mistake and we should wait or rethink it. Other times it might be a sponsor or someone else who has more experience and can help us understand what's right for us at a certain time, especially in early recovery. Deuteronomy 3.23-3.25 to Moses says, I implored God at that time, saying, My Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what power is there in heaven or on earth that can perform according to your deeds and according to your mighty acts? Let me now cross and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan, this good mountain and the Lebanon. So Moses here is asking God to rethink, to to reverse his earlier decree that Moses not be allowed to enter the promised land. So you'll recall earlier in if it's go in Numbers twenty eleven. God was God told Moses to speak to a rock and that water would come out of the rock for the Israelites to drink. 
Instead, Moses uh, hit the rock with a stick and uh, water came out. But somehow this defiance of God's instructions was enough for God to punish Moses um, and to prohibit, prohibit him from entering the promised land. So Moses is asking for this decree to be annulled. Because they're right now, they're really at the edge of the promised land. He, you know, he wants Moses is asking to cross the Jordan to see the promised land. He's devoted his entire life to this moment, and I think maybe we can relate to this in some way. In thinking back on our time of addiction, maybe there are mistakes we made, which had repercussions on our life, and we wish we could go back and change them. Or we want to change the re repercussions. And I think we, you know, a lot of us have this kind of experience. There's people who don't speak to us anymore. Or we might have family members who are estranged because of the way we acted when we were drinking or using. Or sometimes we just say we've had bad luck, you know, bad things didn't work out for us. So maybe we too can ask for these decisions to be annulled. Maybe God can help us annul, you know, the decree of a friend who no longer speaks to us and that kind of thing. And as Moses shows, you should never give up hope and never stop trying to reverse a punishment. Yet the assumption also has to be that we're doing the work necessary to earn the release of the punishment. And finally, I think there's an important idea of learning to accept the finality of a judgment like this if that's the way it's meant to be so that you can get on with your life and continue to grow so Deuteronomy 3.29 Moses continues this recounting of their journeys it simply says so we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor so what is Beth Peor? Beth Peor is a location it's a city on the route that the Israelites took on their long trip from Egypt to the Promised Land. And Beth Peor was the city near the Israelite encampment where the princesses of Midian enticed the Israelites into sexual immorality and idol worship. This was described in Numbers 25, 1-3. It was where Phineas avenged the honor of God by killing the Israelite and the Midianite who were um, committing sexual immorality in front of Moses. So why is Moses reminding the Israelites of this shameful episode now on the eve of their entrance into the promised land? This is a really a cringe-worthy moment, so to speak. I think and a lot of us have our own cringe-worthy moments, our bottoms, things that we just wish had never happened we're embarrassed about or even feel worse about you know we've done things that we regret what does it mean to be reminded of our past behavior in this way the commentators note though that this mention really shows how merciful God can be really the punishment for these sins should have been either death or a permanent barring of these people from entering the promised land yet here they are they're about to enter into the promised land so god has tremendous power of forgiveness and so we too perhaps can be forgiven for our transgressions if we do the work make amends and concentrate on our defects of character we too can enter our own promised land so to speak if we seek forgiveness from those we have harmed deuteronomy 4 1 says, Now, O Israel, listen to the decrees and to the ordinances that I teach you to perform so that you may live and you will come to possess the land that God, the God your, of your forefathers, gives you. This verse contains a simple but powerful concept in the Bible, which is that the possession, in, in, with regard to the Israelites, but also to people in general, Possessing the land of Israel and life itself is contingent on following the decrees and ordinances of the Bible. The Israelites are not entitled to the land unconditionally. If they do not follow the laws of God, they will lose the right to be there. And indeed, that is what happened. 
And you could say, yes, the Babylonians and the Romans evicted the Israelites from the land, but they were really acting as God's agents. What happened was that the Israelites had sinned so excessively at those times that they lost their possession of the land. There's no magic guarantee that they get to stay in the land. And in our lives, we can look at this verse and, and think of the promised land as a metaphor for, for a high quality recovery. This is what we seek. Our dream should be to live a sober life of serenity. And this is going to mean different things to different people. But most alcoholics would agree that having such a life is a, is a major goal of theirs. So how do we get there? And how do we stay there, maybe more importantly? The answer is very simple but difficult at times. We must follow the decrees and ordinances of God. We must follow the guidance of our higher powers. This guidance aligns well with the steps. Honesty, belief in a higher power, prayer, meditation, treating others with, with respect, admitting we were wrong and making amends, and on and on. This is the path to our own personal promised lands. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor shall you subtract from it to observe the commandments of God, your God, that I command you. So what this means is God is telling the Israelites not to add onto the Torah or remove from it. The Bible is is considered perfect and complete. It's the word of God directly from the mouth of God. Therefore, it may not be modified by human beings. Now, there's a lot of difficulties with this idea, one of which is that, obviously, you know, the Bible has been translated and edited a number of times. I mean, it's not like human hands have never touched it. But... Um, <clears throat> The, the people who believe in God generally believe that the Bible was written, was the Word of God. Um, now, of course, there are people who believe that the Bible was written by other human beings, and I'm just, I'm not going to get into that argument. I'm just saying that for the purposes of our own spiritual growth, um, we should consider that the words of the Bible are the Word of God, and that they mean something to us, and, um, and, 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 and and of course, there's differences of interpretation. That's another layer of difficulty with this. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there's differences in ritual or belief, but the essential text is not supposed to be changed. Meaning, like, if the Bible says you shall observe a Sabbath every seven days, um, you're not supposed to say, well, I'll celebrate the Sabbath every ninth day because I'm special, right? You're supposed to observe the Sabbath on the seventh day. Um, it may seem dogmatic, but there's an important spiritual truth to this idea. God has commanded, has commandments for us to follow. If we don't understand them, that reflects a defect in us, not in God. And recovery presents a similar dynamic. We may not understand the steps or the direction we get in the program. However, we will generally do better if we try to stop ourselves from changing the program to suit our own needs rather than working harder to understand what we are actually hearing. You know, so like some of us may say, well, I'm, I'm going to do eight of the 12 steps. I'll be fine with those. I don't need them all. That's almost always a mistake. The complete program is necessary for sobriety. It was created with a lot of wisdom, and we need to open ourselves up to understanding the wisdom and intent of the program rather than editing out what we don't think is important. Deuteronomy 4.25 says... When you beget children and grandchildren and will have been long in the land, you will become corrupt and make a carved image, a likeness of anything, and you will do evil in the eyes of God, your God, to anger him. Moses warns the Israelites that they risk becoming complacent once they occupy the land. This is a condition that will lead their children, who did not witness the miracles of the Wilderness to, wilderness to stray from the path of the Torah. The you in this verse is understood to represent present and future generations, not any specific individual. So what does this mean to us? So you can ask, perhaps, how do our children handle our addiction and recovery? 
In some cases, it's obvious that a parent's addiction is negatively affecting their children. In other situations, the damage is less obvious, but it's still there. Recovery is a gift we can give our children to help them live healthier lives. We can interpret the verse to mean that our sober selves are, in effect, like the children of our addict selves, a later generation of the self that may or may not remember the miracles of recovery that saved our lives. Like the second and third generation of Israelites in the land, we might lose sight of where we came from and revert to bad behavior. We need to stay connected with the program to remain in a healthy state of recovery. Deuteronomy 4.29 reads, From there, meaning the exile, from there you will seek God and you will find... I'm sorry, let me say that again. From there you will seek God, your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your hearts and all your soul. And what he's referring to here is an, is an exile in the future. God is... This is a prophecy that the Israelites will be expelled from the promised land, which, which happened. Uh, it says in an earlier verse in Deuteronomy 4.27, God warns the Israelites, God will scatter you among the peoples as a punishment for the sin of idolatry. And unfortunately, this is true. And if you know your history, you'll know that the Israelites, the Jewish people, spent the years between the year 70 and the year 1948, almost 2,000 years, wandering the world without a homeland. And even now, we don't have a temple in Jerusalem. Um, yet God is also offers a word of hope and mercy. You will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. This, the loss we experience in addiction is like the eviction of the Israelites from the promised land. It was a terrible tragedy, yet it was also something the Israelites largely brought on themselves. The Romans and before them, the Babylonians and the Assyrians were merely agents of God. Addiction and relapse are similar. They're like our own personal exiles, ex being expelled from ourselves, so to speak. They keep us away from people and places we love. But God is there for us, however, if we seek him with all of our hearts and all of our souls. God will be there for us to help us make the journey back to where we belong. You've been listening to the For I Will Be With You podcast. Daily Reflections on Recovery from the Bible. www.foriwillbewithyou.com